Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very, very special guest today is legendary author S.E. Hinton. This is the first of a two-part interview. Thank you for being here, Susie. Oh, thank you for asking me. I heard someone the other day say it. I said, Susie, Susie Hinton's going to be on the show. And they said, isn't she a recluse? And I <laughs> said, no, no, no. How did that get started? Well, I'm, I am a private person. I mean, you'll never find me in the society page. I don't, no. I don't enjoy, you know, group activities. But I'm not reclusive. If you want to find me, I'm in petties on Fridays. I mean, <laughs> there I am. Um, and, you know, my husband and I are hobbies, eating out. Half our social circle is white persons. Oh yeah, they're very, you're very popular. You know them on a first name basis. Yeah. And share personal information. <laughs> so you know, I'm I'm not reclusive. I'm just not socially inclined. Mm -hmm. I do what I you know mm -hmm. what I like, but what I like to do is read a book, you know, play with the cat, go ride my horses, and you just don't find that on the society page. You just told me before we were on camera about your cat's senior moment. Share that. Oh. I, I have a barn cat, and he was like third generation feral, and I brought him home, and he's always been odd. He's about <laughs> 15 now, and I've trained him to, when he wants milk, to sit up and do a little, you know, when he was younger, it was like, go, go, <laughs> but, you know, now if he just hoists himself up, I consider it a dance, and we're in the kitchen, and he was like meowing around, and, rubbing its corners, and then all of a sudden he just stopped and like, what am I doing here? Why am I in this room? And I said, milk? He goes, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so, yeah, but, you know, I reckon I see in your moments these days. Not only are you not a recluse, you're on Twitter now. How did that happen? Well, I follow some people on Twitter, the Supernatural actors for mm -hmm. one, and um, at first I just, and some of, you know, a lot of my, um, outsiders boys are on Twitter so I thought I'll get on and follow them and see what they're up to and the first few days I was on I had like six followers and then uh, Ralph Macchio um, that played Johnny in the Outsiders mm -hmm. tweeted that he was following me and then Emilio and Rob tweeted that they were following me and all of a sudden you know I'm 500 followers. I'm going like, thank you, Outsiders boys. <laughs> now I, I have to think of something to say. <laughs> yeah, well, and you are saying, tell us about your tweet today. Oh, today I tweeted that um, it was national, it is, National Kiss and Makeup Day, and I wish I'd had a fight with Daniel Craig. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. But one of the ironies about your going on Twitter is you found out your name had already been taken. Oh, Lordy, yes. I started to sign up as my Twitter as Essie Hinton, and somebody had taken it. And I thought, well, gosh, I hope they're not posting nude pictures, <laughs> unless they're really, really hot. Yeah, yeah, and then that's okay. <laughs> so mine is Essie for real Hinton. <laughs> so, so we'll put that at the end of the show for people who are interested in following you, and I know there are going to be a lot that will. So many of the questions you get on Twitter relate to the outsiders. It's been over 40 years, Susie. What gives that book its staying power? I mean, these boys didn't have iPads, they didn't have cell phones, but yet we relate to that mindset and that culture. Well, uh, a lot of it is it's still being used in schools. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I get a lot from teachers. The kids still relate to these guys, even though they don't have cell phones. You know, it, it, they relate to the feeling of being an outsider in the school. Some of them are just feel like they're an outsider. Some of them are in the same situation as the guys in the book. Uh, some of them are what they would say is social mm -hmm. people, but it's changed the way they look at other classes. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they say, you know, it's changed the way I deal with other people. So I think there's a lot of universal uh, connections to be made to the outsiders because not only is it resonate in the United States. It's 
all over the world. Oh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it's really wonderful to think about a book. And there are not many books that last that long. And it, I think we can easily call it a contemporary classic. I mean, it fits that category. Well, I'll go with that. Will you go with that? <laughs> <laughs> I, one of the things that's exciting for me about The Outsiders right now is going to be out in the ebook edition. Yeah, the ebook edition should be out, I, I think, this fall, which. Um, is, is great with me, you know, because I have a Kindle. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that because you're a huge book lover. You have a very impressive library. How do you feel about the Kindle in terms of what it's going to do to the book business? Well, you know, there's some people who, who just say, you know, I could never get up, give up the feel and the smell of books. Mm -hmm. Well, almost every shelf in my, every wall in my house is filled with bookshelves. And I know what a book smells like. <laughs> I very well know what it mm -hmm. feels like, but I can read, and this is another senior moment, I can read on the Kindle so much better changing the font. Mm -hmm. And it's easy, it's easy to hold. It's a lot easier to hold than a hardback, mm -hmm. which I tend to buy anyway. And I'm looking at it, and here's this, and I've got 200 books there, instead of having to build more shelves through my house. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I love it too. We've talked about it before, just over lunch, and about how much fun it is. You're a voracious reader. There's no question about that. Who are your favorite authors? Uh, Jane Austen, still. Of course, I'm in the middle right now, rereading Mansfield Park. I want to slap Fanny Price upside the head. <laughs> uh, to me, it's an example of an author writing what she thinks she should mm -hmm, write mm -hmm. instead of what she really wants to write. Mm -hmm. But you can learn so much about writing from reading Jane Austen, even though you're stuck, I always read better than I write, which is not easy, you know, it's not hard. Mm -hmm. I find that all over the place, but even though my style mm -hmm. and even my subject matter is nothing like Jane Austen's, you can learn a lot. Emma's my favorite, and between the mystery and the characterization, mm -hmm. and she does so wonderfully with characterization through dialogue, mm -hmm. which is one of my fortes. I learn something every time I reread her. I reread her stuff all the time. If you could ask Jane Austen one question, what would it be? Uh, that's a tough one. That's a very tough one. I uh, probably say you want to have a glass of wine and gossip. <laughs> she probably would take you up on that. She <laughs> needed a little bit more of a social life. <laughs> she was more reclusive than you are. It tends to be. What do you think about the films based on Austen's work? Uh, some of them are good, some of them are ghastly. I haven't seen a good version of Emma yet. Of all things, Clueless, mm -hmm. which was based mm -hmm. on Jane Austen, kind of, you know, is, is my favorite of the remakes, but Persuasion, man, is that a great movie. I love Persuasion. I liked Sense and Sensibility, too, very much. So, uh, you know, uh, it's like the books. Mm -hmm. Not her books, but mm -hmm. I mean books in general. Some you like, some you don't like. Yeah, exactly. Good point. There have been some great movie versions, though, of your books, and I'd like to talk about them. First of all, Tex. What's your fondest memory of the filming of Tex? Well, first thing, I made two of my best friends forever on that shoot. Tim Hunter, the director, and Tim Zinneman, the producer. At a certain age, you know, I was in my early 30s, you think you're through making your best friends. Mm -hmm. But they have remained my best friends through that. I mean, I've got a list of like five best friends. You're on it. I uh, like that. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, so I made some of my best friends there. But I, I met Matt, who, you know, went on to play in a couple other of my movies. Mm -hmm. Met Emilio, and my horse is in it, which is one of my favorite things. Toyota. My Toyota, my horse that I raised from a four-month-old colt, and was my baby for so long, and he does great. It was a stretch because he was you know, a champion hunter and he was mm -hmm. playing a cow horse. And uh, he loved Matt. He would knock me down to get to Matt. Uh, the older cowboy that at the ranch we were keeping Toyota and giving Matt riding lessons was going, well, that horse is trying to help that boy. <laughs> and he was. And he was so relaxed and he looks great on film. And it was the prime of his life. The next year, on, he missed half the shows just to do that movie and went on to be a, a regular working hunter reserve mm -hmm. for the next year. So um, 
I love looking at that just to look at the horse. Yeah, wasn't that Toyota pretty much a deal breaker for you on that movie? Oh, yeah. When uh, the Disney executive, Tom Wilhite, came to talk me into it, first I didn't want Disney to do Tex. I mean, mm -hmm. they, had, they had never done a, you know, anything other than the Gene movie. And I was picturing, you know, Seth Tex meets Seven Dwarfs and mm -hmm. said, you know, I really didn't want to do it. And then Tom Wilhite comes to my door and he, and we went, to, did lunch, the first time I did it, did lunch with the movie <laughs> people. And um, he was saying, now, we've offered you as much money as we can. And I said, well, money's fine. And he goes, and um, would you like to visit the set? And that was before Tim Hunter decided he mm -hmm. went shooting Tulsa. And I said, sure, that sounds good. And he said, well, would you like a free trip to Disneyland? I said, oh, David, I love Disneyland. That sounds good. And he's looking at me and he said, okay, Susie, what's it going to take? I said, I've got a horse. It's perfect for the horse part. <laughs> and he said, okay. He's got the part. And I said, you got the book. And that was that. Was Toyota skittish at all before the cameras? Because there's lots of stuff going on. It's a he loved it. He, he loved it, really? He And he was a horse that would make up a bear in the bush to entertain himself. He had a vivid entertainment. He liked something going on all the time. And I bored the heck out of him. Because <laughs> I didn't want an adventure. I wanted a nice ride. But... All the cameras, and oh, he had an ego like you wouldn't believe. He was so used to winning at the shows. When they called out first place, he'd step out, and, you know, whether he'd won the class or not. But um, you just knew all those people, the lights and camera were for him. And the locate, you know, the uh, production manager said, I've never seen a horse this well behaved on camera. He loved Matt. You can see him nibbling at Matt's pockets for carrots because the two weeks I had to give Matt riding lessons, and I wasn't Rachel, teaching him how to ride every horse, I was teaching him how to ride my horse. Sure. And I had him have carrots in his pockets at all times, so my horse expected him to have carrots with him. And there's a cute scene where he's just like nibbling at Matt's pockets, and he says, oh, you got your carrot detector working over time. Yeah, it was, but it was very, very fun shoot, very relaxed. Uh, Matt couldn't be worked over eight hours a day because, uh, you know, he was a minor, and so most we could have was 12 hour days. Well, Toyota wasn't the only member of your family who was in Tex, you were. You made a cameo appearance. Oh, yes, I played the typing teacher. After you watch it, for, first Tim was saying, you want you know, to be, and I was going, no, I don't want to be a, an extra. I don't want anything to do with this whole thing. But after you watch them for a while, it looks like it's easy. It, you know, it looks like, you know, oh, sure. I, and. So they, and I said, oh, I'll be in it. I'll, you know, I, the typing teacher, I can be that. Where I run in and say, Kathy, they put caps on top. Oh man, before I went on, I was so nervous. Were I just, you? Oh, I was a wreck. I was just a total wreck. Fortunately, I was supposed to look like a total wreck. Bug-eyed, <laughs> you know, uh, when Hot I casting. ran into the room. So that was easy. And I just knew I was gonna run in there and start going, my marks, my marks. <laughs> But I did, ran in there and hit my marks, and we got it all in two takes. Let's watch it. Kathy, <laughs> 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 somebody has put caps in the typewriters. And you two were laughing just a little bit too early, weren't you? Me? I love watching that clip. Did you ever think about going into acting? I think I could handle a few lines. It takes a lot more energy than most people realize to do acting. But I guess it's something like writing that everybody thinks they could probably do it. But um, I really enjoyed my next uh, cameos. And, you know, I thought... Like, well, I've kept up my SAG card, you know, just in case just Francis. Just in case. Just in case Francis calls. Yeah. As I'm ready. Francis, you're referring to Francis Ford Coppola and then The Outsiders and the wonderful experience of making that film. What did you learn from Francis Ford Coppola, not only about technique, but about living? Well, I love Francis. I mean, um, he was so down to earth. He was so good at the boys. You know, he drove himself to the set in a VW you know, uh, the mm -hmm. Volkswagen Rabbit. Uh, he picked up his trash after we ate. I mean, I would tell the boys, 
see Francis putting his mm -hmm. dishes in the trash can? You can do that too, if he can. Um, he's very good with the boys. Um, he was, you know, on the set, and he was, I don't know, he was just tons to work with, you know, fun. And I heard one of the cast, one of the cast told me, he said, well, I heard Francis say he really likes working with Susie because she's always got an opinion if she's asked for it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't in there going, oh, you could, should do this, this, that. But I was there, and he wanted me sitting right next to him in my, I got my director's chair, in case, you know, he wanted to ask me a question. He would take a good suggestion from anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was... Uh, and he, you know, I just, I just thought he was, was great to and, work with. And he was always very respectful of you and the book itself, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. When I was, he and I really co-wrote the screenplay for that. He did the major work. He got a copy of the paperback and he sliced up the pages and he outlined the action in one color, the introspection in one color, the dialogue in one color and kind of chopped it up and pasted it on a page and had somebody type it up. Mm -hmm. And so we had a rough draft to work with very early. And when he got through with it, it was about like this. And he handed it to me and said, could you cut it for me, Susie? And I said, sure, I'm really good at cutting. And I thought, here's my chance. I'll fix the outsiders. Because <laughs> you know at 30, I can see a lot of things mm -hmm. wrong with it and stuff. And I, I'm a good cutter, I am, I have to say, with no modesty whatsoever. I'm a good cutter, but he would read it, and then he would say, but this, this sentence, it's not like just like the one in the book. And I'd say, no, Francis, it's, but it's better. And he goes, no, we're making this for the audience of the book. They want it just like the book. And he said, your cuts are great, but don't rewrite yourself. So that was my big problem with working him, is he wanted it just like the book. Do you drink Coppola wine? Oh, sure. I visited his Rukon uh, estates this um, summer, and I was out visiting our kids in San Francisco, and just missed seeing him by that much. He was in <laughs> San Diego with his new movie he's advertising, but uh, yeah, I drink Coppola's wine. Rob Lowe, in his autobiography, writes extensively about his experiences on The Outsiders and the filming and being in Tulsa. Your thoughts on that? You read the book, didn't you? Oh, yeah. And Rob's memory very much coincides with mine uh, as far as, this, I didn't realize that Francis intimidated the boys mm -hmm. the way he, he says they did. And of course, they've all talked to me about his casting process where he had all of them, you know, everybody come in and read for different parts and they all found that really scary. And I honestly believe Francis when he said I thought it'd be fun for him. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess they just were all in the tither about it. And if you watch the complete novel DVD, one of the extras is the casting process, which is amazing because there were so many people trying out for the different parts. And uh, Ralph Macchio told me, he goes, and I was so mad because I, I knew I wanted to play Johnny and he, and he showed me his seventh grade essay of On the Outsiders. So if they ever make a movie, I want to play Johnny. And of course he ended up with the part, but he, he didn't like having to read for Pony Boy or any of those other things. But uh, I didn't know directly what went on in the hotel. I didn't want to know <laughs> at the end of, you know, when it's the end of the day, I went home. Uh, they went back to the hotel. They ran wild. I think this comes out in Rob's book. And uh, Tom Cruise once said, uh, he was somewhere, and a guy went up and introduced himself and said, I was uh, working at the hotel when you guys were shooting the outsiders and the first words out of Tom's mouth were, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned a moment ago that you used Francis as a good example, as sort of a role model with the boys. Did you take sort of a motherly interest in them? Oh yes, I was their mother. That was a big job, wasn't it? Oh, it was huge because all these, these little boys, Tommy was 15, uh, Ralph was 20, and they were all ages in between. I mean, Rob celebrated his 18th birthday on the set, and they, were, they had no adult supervision, counsel, mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. So immediately, I, uh, I don't know, I just took them over, and I realized after that experience that I would be a good mother 
because I could mm. nag, scold, and needlessly worry with the best of them. How did Diane Lane fit into the dynamic? Uh, Diane was a very, very sweet girl, very nice, and she really would have liked to just hang out and have been one of the guys. But whenever she came on the set, I don't know, their testosterone just <laughs> went wild and they immediately goofed around and they played pranks on her in the hotel and I hope she saw it as the tribute of love they had, but you know how teenage boys can be. And I think she really would have preferred a more relaxed one of the guys part instead of like having the guys bump into each other and fall over themselves whenever it was her turn to shoot. Have you followed her career? Oh yeah, I think she's a great actress. So you sort of bonded with these with these characters, with these actors. Yes, yes, um, very very much with those actors, absolutely. And we, st you know, we still email. I'm still for any time that we're in the same city together. I feel free to, you know, say, hey, can you know, if you got time to have dinner or something. I mean, it's. Were you watching Dancing with the Stars when Ralph oh, was on? Oh yes, when Ralph was on, he was so good, and it was so nice that he picked his. Waltz, I think, was um, the stay gold theme mm -hmm. from the Outsiders, and he said it was their wedding theme at their their wedding. And and then yeah. the uh, next thing he danced to was the theme from Ro Romeo and Juliet movie, which was Dave and I's wedding song. So it was like, oh, this is so cute. And you were rooting for him right yeah, to definitely, the end. Definitely, yeah. And he could dance because uh, he'd trained as a dancer as a kid, but unfortunately, you know, like everybody else, he's getting older. <laughs> you also made a cameo appearance in The Outsiders, too. Let's watch that. What's happened to your gown? I threw it away. I'm going to be so get glad out. when Just you're Just get out. You're making, making make my gentlemen. stomach Thank sick. <laughs> What's the backstory on that clip? Well, you know, of course, I'd done it. I'd been in ticks. <laughs> I was okay with it. So, um, you know, when the casting director uh, asked me if I'd play the nurse in Dallas's room, I said, sure. And it was very easy. It's my best acting. But I was so used to Matt hassling me <laughs> at that point. And I had to walk in, set down my water, look at Matt, blah, 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 blah turn around and bump into the guys. And it's my best acting, but it was very easy. I'm, and you know, two takes again. I was, mm. I was pretty proud of myself there, but yeah. Uh, I was used to Matt being, of course there was nowhere for me to go after that scene, except over in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you know, we had cameras blocking the entrance and everything. And Matt's next scene was in his underwear. <laughs> and I said, Matt, I'm looking at the closet. You know, I'm looking right at this corner. I'm not going to look at you in your underwear. Don't get upset. <laughs> of course I saw it when I saw the movie. Yeah, but. absolutely. What sort of direction did Francis give you for that scene? He didn't give me any direction. Really? It was like he trusted me to, like, go in there and... That's empowering, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I think, I think that's... I'm just surprised he hadn't cast me in Godfather 3 or... Well, maybe if there's a Godfather four or five, you'll be in the running for it. I think you'd be terrific. You know, he uses horses in his films, but, <laughs> but not quite in the way that we would want uh, your horses to be be remembered or, or immortalized. I wanted to ask you just quickly about what you referenced a moment ago, the DVD, the complete movie, because there's a distinction. Francis went back and redid part of the movie. Explain what that was about. Well, Francis was getting so many letters from kids saying at, after the first cut. I mean, when it f appeared in theaters going, and I was shocked when I saw it in the theater because uh, we had shot the whole movie and it was chopped up mm -hmm. so badly. I thought, well, if you hadn't read the book, you wouldn't even mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. what's going on. It was like, to me, a comic classic where they hit this highlight, this highlight, this highlight, and cut it to 90 minutes like their audience couldn't sit still that long, mm -hmm. which to me was, I thought it was kind of insulting. But I didn't say anything, you know, when my... Honestly, it was not my movie, it was Francis's movie. But later he said, I don't know what I was thinking. And 
when he'd gotten so many letters from kids, why, why didn't you see shoot this scene and this scene and this scene? Where's this scene? And then he had to go speak to his granddaughter's class on it because uh, they were reading The Outsiders, and he, he thought, oh, they're all going to be asking me where's it. And so he cobbled together some of the deleted scenes from the movie and took that to show at his granddaughter's uh, school and then decided to re-release re it with the deleted scenes added. There's about 20 minutes more of the deleted mm -hmm. scenes in it. And um, he's the only director I know that went back and recut a movie because the fans of the book asked him to. And he changed the music too, didn't he? Yeah, the music was changed. Uh, uh, some of it, the music works, some of it doesn't, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But uh, the scenes, like Rob's scene with his brothers was included in that, and he did such a good job. And the opening scene where everybody is introduced was so vital to that movie, I thought, when Pony Boys jumped, mm -hmm. and then the game, the whole game comes to the rescue. It's the only time in the whole book or movie that the whole gang is in one spot, and you get introduced to them one by one. I thought that was very important, and it's, you know, I, I still think it's a great scene. Oh, I love it. I love the complete version. I think it's better, don't you? Oh, yeah. Susie, we're not finished. You've agreed in a weak moment to stay for a second segment. So thank sure. you for being here. You're welcome. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.